thank you for coming along and being one of our webinar speakers for the ACT election web, uh, that is coming up on the 17th of October. I do believe that actually uh, the, the, the polling will be pre-polling commences, I think, in uh, 28th of September, I think. So there's, there's a long lag time between uh, the actual election date. Um, just, so we, just so you know, uh, your guest tonight, of course, uh, well, sorry, uh, your host tonight is David DeLima and myself. I'm the New South Wales ACT Director and David is the South Australian Northern Territory Director. We will look after you tonight in terms of uh, fielding questions and also making sure that everything runs smoothly, I hope. Um, if I can, I'd like to now introduce the three webinar speakers for tonight. And they are, of course, uh, Andrew Wall. Welcome, Andrew. Andrew is a current MLA and is a member of the Liberal Party. So welcome, Andrew. Thanks, Greg, for having us. And our second speaker is Dr. Brendan Long. He's now officially a Labor candidate. And I think you're in the seat of... Uh, no, which seat are you in? Murrumbidgee. Uh, Murrumbidgee. Thanks for the one. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Brendan. And Brendan's our, our second speaker. And of course, we're delighted to have Lara Kirk, who I think heads up the Family and Marriage uh, Division of Catholic Archdiocese of Canberra and Goulburn. So welcome, Lara, to you as well. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Now, what we normally do at, uh, with these webinars is we, we ask David to make a few comments and open up in prayer if everyone's comfortable with that. Over to you, David. Hmm. Yes, thank you, Greg, and good evening, everyone. Let's just commit this evening to God in prayer. Our Father, we thank you that we still in this nation enjoy many freedoms, freedom of association, freedom of speech, freedom of faith. And we pray that as a result of tonight's meeting, that all of those who participate will be strengthened in their faith and will be encouraged by you to speak up, that we may meet as your people and that the whole of the community may be enriched by wise policies. So we commit the forthcoming election to you. And Lord, it is an election where there are some very serious matters under consideration. And it's a choice really between life and death in some, some situations. So we commit it to you. We pray for all the candidates. We pray for the parties. Uh, and we pray that your people will serve as salt and light in order to impact this election and really cause some needed reforms there in this Australian Capital Territory. So we commit tonight and the election to you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, thank you very much. So what we've got to do is um, have a fairly, fairly structured format for tonight, if you don't mind. The way it will work is I'll ask each of the speakers to speak for about five to seven minutes on how they see the issues uh, currently before the electorate in the OCT. And then I'd really like to open it up to questions because the questions have been coming in. Can I ask all those people that have registered to type in their questions? And we will look at those as we come further into the program. Uh, there's no hard and fast rule, but uh, could I ask Andrew to kick off the night and um, alphabetically, I guess, your B, Brendan, Andrew's A, so we'll go with Andrew. <laughs> uh, Andrew, over to you and uh, five to seven minutes, if a couple of minutes more doesn't matter, on how you see how you see the elections shaping up in terms of issues of concern. Thank you, Andrew. Well, thank you for that, Greg. And, and with the surname Wall, it's very rarely that I do get to go first. Um, <laughs> look, I think that the focus for, for me and the Liberal team this election is to make Canberra uh, the best place to live, work and raise a family. Um, the focuses for us are largely uh, placed on how we can make it easier for families, uh, particularly uh, in my electorate in Tuggeranong, which is still very much a, a family orientated community, uh, as, as are most of the, uh, the outer suburbs of Canberra. Uh, you know, Canberra has been uh, punished for particularly the last eight years, but over 19 years of, of labour in office on a number of fronts. Um, cost of living has got out of control. We've had rates increases that have had a huge impact on the household budget. Uh, we've seen the costs of housing have increased substantially and rent in the ACT now is, is a national, leads the nation in, in the most mm. expensive. Uh, now with a median rental price of $575 a, a week, wow. which is 
you know, for many, many households, a real struggle just to, to make ends meet. Um, the focus for us in recent weeks has been articulating how we're going to go about doing things differently to, to improve housing affordability, to put an end to those rates increases. Uh, and just today we announced the, a policy initiative to, uh, again, help the family budget out by uh, placing a, a uh, well, bringing ACT vehicle registration costs in line with New South Wales, uh, which for the average family means almost a $90 per vehicle saving per year. So you know, small things that in, in, in total add up to, to quite a lot. Um, in recent weeks, we've also had uh, a significant amount to say about education. Uh, sadly, uh, under Labor, particularly in the last uh, four years of the Labor government, uh, it seems that the Minister for Education has been more focused on government schools uh, and not all schools. Uh, we've seen a reduction of funding uh, for our non-government school sector and bearing in mind that you know, the non-government schools are our faith-based schools predominantly. Uh, and it, I think regardless of which school you choose to send your children to as a Canberran, you should be able to do so knowing that they are receiving adequate and reasonable funding to meet the needs of uh, all students that are enrolled at those schools. Um, we've also spoken about our plan to improve academic performance in our schools by focusing more on the fundamentals uh, of literacy and numeracy uh, in, in classrooms rather than having, uh, I guess, some of the, the more questionable uh, theories that have been taught uh, in our schools. Um, the big focus, I, I guess the big belief is there is a better way. Uh, we've had 19 years of labour in the ACT. Um, you know, David, in your opening, you touched on that there are a number of areas where I think there's serious concern in many corners of the community about the social agenda that has been pursued. Uh, it, it has at times been a very radical social agenda uh, and often the legislative changes are very much a, a way of uh, you know, changing the social fabric of our community, uh, often at the expense of our freedoms, be it our freedom of speech or our freedom of uh, religious expression. Uh, the government, and uh, the Labor government has, you know, whilst they're often seen as, as very strong on, on the social justice front, uh, I think it's very concerning to see the performance of, of labour over the rec over the last couple of terms of government. Uh, we have more children in care uh, than we've ever had before. We've got one of the highest correction, uh, recidivist rates in our correction system. Uh, we've had funding cut from many of our social services. Uh, so whilst labour are very keen to, to tout that they are you know, the, the best for our, our social services in our community and on that front, uh, often the rhetoric fails to live up to the, well, often the, uh, the funding and the actions fail to live up to the rhetoric. So this election, um, I guess the, the big message that I would convey is you know, that there is a better way. Uh, the, the Liberals are very much focused on making Canberra a far more family friendly place to live uh, and a far more uh, affordable city for families to, to, to live in and to thrive in. Um, I'm more keen to get into the questions tonight. So I'll leave the opening commentary there um, and uh, look forward to seeing what some of the, uh, the attendees have got to say in uh, what is a, a very new but seems very familiar so, you know, online forum, uh, which we've all become very used to this year. Thank you very much, Andrew, much appreciated. Um, Brendan, I'd like to sort of introduce you. Now, I've known Brendan for a while now. We've met in Canberra many times. We've even had lunch, I think, Brendan. We yeah, have, in, in, the, in the refectory at Parliament House. But I think we paid at the time, Andrew, so. <laughs> 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 but look, welcome He's along. <laughs> oh, no. Welcome along, Brendan. I really appreciate you making the time. And for those that are on board, please note that Brendan is now an official candidate. Uh, so over to you, Brendan, for an overview of the issues as you see them as a candidate. Yeah, thank you very much, Greg. And it's always a pleasure to um, you know, join with people of faith uh, and discuss things that are important to us. Uh, for, I've worked for the uh, Catholic Church now for two or three years and um, are now moving into seeking to be a candidate. Now, I'm an unusual character. Um, I'm both an economist and a theologian. Uh, I do know two or three other people like me, but only two or three. Um, so, in a rare breed, and I'll sort of brief my, uh, bring my comments in in that vein. Um, you know, the, I think when to to take, I suppose, the Labor Party view forward to people who are voting in the election. Um, one of the things I think is interesting to think about is a sort of social gospel perspective. And um, that is 
essentially what from a Christian view of the world can you say should be priorities of government uh, in terms of meeting core attitudes, core values, core biblical principles. And one of those big biblical principles, of course, is the um, provision of um, support and services to those who are on lower incomes, you know, the biblical idea of uh, uh, looking after the widow and the orphan, but in the contemporary context, perhaps, it's a focus on those in need. And uh, I suppose one thing that we would, uh, what I would sort of want to emphasize is good about one, the Labor's perspective is to focus on people in need in the current crisis. The current crisis is a, obviously the COVID crisis. It's an enormous problem we see on the news tonight, uh, shocking figures across the world as spikes are coming up, particularly in the Holy Land. Um, but here in Canberra, we have no, we have no um, infections, but we do have the economic effects of it. And this is hitting people harder on lower incomes. Um, the big threat, I think, is to jobs. Now I've got five kids and I've got one in year 12. And I think it must be a pretty scary time to be a year 12 student in Canberra. Um, now she's a good student, um, but you know, like facing the prospect of having to enter the workforce now is a very challenging thing. So one thing I think is, is a plus for Labor is this Jobs for Canberrans program where we've looked at creating a number of jobs, new jobs, real jobs, for targeted at, at people who um, you will know, be entering the labour market and also to try to fill the gaps in Commonwealth support programs, targeting people who are eligible for JobKeeper and JobSeeker. And therefore, especially for those ineligible for JobSeeker, that includes refugees and people on temporary resident permits who are not eligible so these, these, this program is targeted at these people who are in genuine need. And so that sort of social justice, social gospel perspective is good. I also think, you know, we do have a big investment in health and health is important, especially at the time of COVID. Five new walk-in centres today across the city, a hospital expansion for 500 million, 400 new health professionals. Is all what, you can always spend more on health, but, I think from our perspective, free healthcare delivered at a high standard by government is a really big social gospel perspective. Enough of those policy issues, the more boring ones. I just want to uh, quickly point to one interesting development, which I think um, people on the web might have found surprising. And that's when the ACT government recently decided to have the, uh, you know, the early pregnancy unit at the, at the uh, Centenary Hospital for Women and Children. Um, so the, this, this was coming from advocacy from a woman called Karen Schlag, and she'd had two miscarriages. And um, she needed support, uh, and, um, and she was called for support for women who have lost their babies before 20 weeks gestation. And, you know, I'm, I'm glad that um, there's been recognition by the ACT government that, you know, you can actually provide services to women who lose children early on in life. I might not be comfortable with all the language that was used around the measure, but I do think it was a good, interesting and unusual development for the ACT Labor Party to actually sort of provide services for unborn children at that early stage of life. Um, I'm just going to conclude by, uh, and this might be a little bit of a controversial point, but I'm not, I'm not a sitting member, so I'm a candidate. So I have a little bit more freedom than the sitting members. So I can simply say that in relation to some measures that have entered the ACT Assembly in recent times, I would not necessarily, I, I would have the opportunity in caucus to seek to oppose measures that I do not support as a Christian. And I would be an active voice against the sort of measures that led to the recent uh, gender choice bill in the ACT. And I would use my freedoms within the party to call for a Christian position 
uh, and and I'd put those uh, that voice strongly. Greg, um, uh, David, that probably will do for Brendan's. Thank you. <laughs> And at, at Brendan, thank you very much. I, I was really pleased for you to mention the social gospel, but uh, more on that later. I have the pleasure of introducing Lara, Lara Kirk. Now, now you, you head up, I believe, the marriage and family uh, section of the uh, uh, Catholic Diocese of Goulburn in Canberra. Lara, I know you're married to a wonderful man, so you must obviously have a good family. Um, <laughs> and you've got very good taste in, <laughs> in uh, spouses. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Lara. Now, you've heard the two candidates, so to speak. Can you put a different perspective on it as, the, as, as a, as, as a Christian-based organisation? Um, Lara, over to you. Sure. Well, a few things to say. One is um, I actually live in, in New South Wales, so I won't be voting in the ACT election. So <laughs> right. I'm a disinterested um, uh, commentator. Um, I guess as... Christians, I guess one thing I would like to remind um, Christians in the ACT, uh, A, we're a small community and we have the capacity to have an influence. B, um, your vote in the ACT actually has more power in some ways than in other electorates because we have the, um, the system where the, the party can't sort of decide who's in which order and, and um, within the party candidates are in fact competing against each other. So I would really, um, really, really encourage Christians to take the time to find out what each of their individual candidates' values are. And so it's great to hear from someone like Brendan in the ALP, who's happy to say that he um, would, uh, you know, stand up for Christian values in the caucus. He may not be able to vote that way in the end, but he can have, he can have a voice. He can have a voice for Christian values there. And um, so, so you can vote across parties because once your vote, if you vote for somebody who represents your values, and once they have enough um, votes to be elected, then your vote um, can go on to the next person. So, so our votes or your votes within the ACT actually have carry quite a lot of power. Um, so uh, it's easy sometimes to feel like it's too hard to engage in the issues. You know, what difference is it going to make? But we've got very good Christian people in our parliament and we really should be supporting that. On the whole, our politicians are very hardworking people and we should um, be grateful for that and take, make the effort to find out about them, find out about their values and views and vote for them if their values correspond with our own. Um, a couple of things. So within the Catholic community on the um, church life survey that happens on a regular basis, the, the top three issues for uh, church going, regular church going Catholics, uh, poverty and disadvantage, uh, then support for marriage and family. And then third is support for asylum seekers and refugees. So those are the three things I just want to quickly touch on. Um, it's good for us as Christians to know that in Canberra, even though we're a wealthy uh, <clears throat> town, there are 30,000 people living below, below the poverty line in Canberra. So that's, you know, the whole GIO stadium or more than, and below the poverty line means you're earning less than $433 a week. And as uh, Andrew pointed out, the median rental market rate in the private rental sector is 500 and something dollars, or so $500 for a two bedroom apartment. So it's just impossible. That's to, just to pay rent and then pay for food and utilities on top of that. So um, <clears throat> as Christians, it's really important for us to be asking our politicians what their views are on, on providing community housing. Uh, the ACT um, does not have a high level of spend per capita on community housing. And there are studies showing that we're at least 3,000 community houses short of the demand at the moment. So I would be asking my um, candidate, if I was voting in Canberra, uh, are they going to take advantage of the low interest rates that are around at the moment and really pour some money into uh, community housing, which will also create jobs? Um, and help us to come out of the COVID crisis with jobs happening. Um, we also need though for low income earners um, assistance because so many people are living under rental pressure, which means that a huge proportion, um, as Andrew was pointing out, a huge proportion of low income earners um, salary is going towards just paying their rent. And that has all sorts of knock on effects for 
stability within the family, just uh, mental health, well-being, and all those sorts of things. So this is a really important issue we should all be, as Christians, asking our politicians about, about their housing um, provision, uh, especially for, um, and some really good things have been happening. There's uh, the Housing First um, program, which where we're taking long-term um, people who are long-term uh, out of out of home and um, providing them with a home, a secure home, so that then, then everything else can, um, can, all their other needs can be met after that. But I don't want, um, that's one important issue. Um, I do want to touch on the um, social agenda that we uh, are experiencing in the current government. And actually I have two, two trust issues that I would have as a Canberra voter. Uh, one trust issue is, is just looking at the way this um, gender identity conversion practices bill went through. It was very, shall we say, irregular, uh, the level of consultation with the community. Um, and to me, that, that goes to an element of trust. If we're trying to introduce good laws, then why don't we have a very good and robust process around that where we have lots of consultation? Um, I think it's pretty disturbing for parents to wake up and find out that they may be able to be charged, uh, fined $24,000 for um, suggesting to their preschool child that mm. it's good to be a boy if you're a boy. Um, this is pretty disturbing. And um, I think that's something Christians should be asking mm. about. Um, there's also a trust issue though on the liberal side because there has been a habit of when it comes to social issues, uh, candidates not uh, putting their views on the record when, when they know that their views are not going to be upheld, there's been a bit of a habit of not voting. And I feel that's um, a problem because, um, you know, bakers bake bread and mechanics, you know, fix cars and politicians vote on legislation. That's what they do. And that's why people elect them. And people don't elect them for their private views, they elect them for, for the views they're prepared to put on the record. So that's a challenge I'd put out um, on that. And the last thing I think, um, which is very important to Catholic Christians is yeah, our treatment of asylum seekers and refugees. Um, and it, people might not know that in Canberra, there's quite a good uh, setup where <clears throat> asylum seekers and refugees do have access to, um, you know, travel cards and, and community housing and that sort of thing, which I think is wonderful. And again, we should be asking any incoming government, are they going to maintain that um, for our uh, asylum seeking and refugee members of our community? So that's me for a start. Okay. Thank you very much, Lara. Um, I'm so pleased you touched on the social issues because what I'd like to put to all, all, all three of you, but in particular the two candidates, is that I'm always amazed that when there's an election on, people talk about economic issues, you're talking about bus stops and you're talking about the hospitals, you're talking about um, bread and butter type issues, but there's a big neglect, a huge neglect on moral and ethical issues, which really impact on the family. And Laura touched on that. So as we go to question time, I want you to give that some thought, please, Brendan and Andrew, because I'm amazed. The emails that have come in to me, Larry, you'll be interested in this. The three main issues that came up for me were uh, chaplaincy in schools, parental rights, and Larry, you love this, homelessness. So they're the three issues that came to me from people that have uh, emailed me. And it's amazing that Governments and, and, and political parties tend to ignore these social and moral issues. So please think about that. We've got a lot of questions. So I'd like to hand over to David to start the questioning off, please, David. Yes, Greg. So uh, from Craig asking Andrew, will the Liberals, if they gain government, reverse some of the laws on gender? Look, they certainly need to be modified, David. Um, we moved on the floor of the Assembly before they passed uh, during the debate uh, a number of amendments. Uh, look, I, I guess at the outset, the, the uh, archaic conversion practices of, of a bygone era that don't exist in the ACT, uh, no one supports them. I, I think that's, that's a foundational point that needs to be made. But the problem with the legislation is the definition was so poorly drafted and so broad that, uh, as Lara touched on, it, it risks criminalising parents for having a conversation at the dinner table with their children. Uh, it put 
barriers to teachers in, in uh, our, our faith schools from practicing the, the faith that parents enroll their children at the school to receive. Uh, it put a barrier on, on church leaders from uh, you know, providing the pastoral care that is so often needed as, as uh, you know, parents and, fa and children uh, navigate, navigate life. The amendments that we sought to institute would protect teachers, faith leaders and parents from being captured or, brought, or, or uh, caught up in that, that definition of, of conversion therapy. And, and we still stand by that as a position as an absolute minimum, that they need to be explicitly protected in the legislation. Yep, and uh, Brendan, if we can... David, sorry, David, I'll interrupt just before you start. Uh, while David and I might ask a question of a specific person, feel free for the others to sort of, you know, add a comment. I don't want you to think that, you know, all questions are going to Brendan or all questions are going to Lara. So feel free, um, the three speakers, to sort of add a comment. I'd, like, I'd like to add a comment. Thank you, Lara. <laughs> um, just with, with, there's also a safeguarding, there's safeguarding issues with this um, gender identity conversion practices bill because um, kids who are suffering or confused can also be kids who are quite vulnerable um, to um, unhealthy advances from mm. people who, you know, have a bad agenda. So mm -hmm. it can make it very tricky for people trying to just have safeguarding types of conversations with vulnerable young people. And I think that's something that needs to be taken into consideration in the drafting of these sorts of laws as well. David and Greg, yeah. my comment's very simple. If I was in the assembly, I would have voted against that bill. Brendan, if I can follow that up with you, um, do you, do you have much hope that if you're elected that you might get some traction on those issues in the party room? And, and a sort of second question that goes with that is, are, are there in a, are there Christians joining the ALP? Um, do you do you need? I, I presume you need more Christians to join the party because the candidates only reflect what the party stands for, the rank and file membership. Would you comment on that? Sure. The first one um, is I don't think the issue of a conscience vote was adequately considered in relation to the gender identity bill. But generally, a conscience vote is issued on questions of this nature. And uh, I would strongly argue in the caucus that I would be free to have that vote. And I think that that would be a position that if I asked the Chief Minister, Andrew Barr for, he would probably support. So I think there is scope for me to be a new voice in Labor. I would admit that I would at this stage probably be the only Christian voice, strong Christian voice in the Labor Party, but things got to start somewhere, David. <laughs> and I'd like to start. And um, Secondly, there are quite a lot of practicing Christians in the Labor Party. And as you know, the, historically, a lot of Catholic, Irish Catholic people um, had that connection. And I'm one of those. And there's still plenty of them in the Labor Party, not well represented in the ACT Assembly. But around the country, you do see these people and the influence of uh, the um, Retail Trade Union, um, which is a strong voice in the party, for Christian values, um, uh, you know, not uh, uh, broad Christian values. And uh, so hope's not lost. Uh, there is something to work with, David. Indeed. And of course, with the shakeup following the federal election of 2019, there's been a lot of soul searching going on. So uh, all strength is uh, to you as you try to uh, reform the party. It, it used to be such an honourable and good party. And as you say, there are many good people in it. And and you need some more. Let's, let's turn to the question of chaplaincy now. And yeah. uh, Brendan, you might go first on that and then we'll handball to Andrew. So what about the reintroduction of chaplaincy in the public schools? Mm. I think it's a great idea. I mean, of course, this is a federal program, which the ACT government in its wisdom has decided that it doesn't want to participate in. And, um, you know, on the ACT Labor website, there is a values section which says that it doesn't support this um, policy. Now, I disagree with that part of the ACT government website, and I'm entitled to disagree with the comment on the ACT ALP website. Um, I think chaplaincy uh, offers, in, in all its forms, a, a very strong um, form of support for um, people, for, for people in, in, in government and non-government schools. So, I mean, I, I'm, I'm a supporter of the program. I'd argue that it'd be, I would argue that it should be funded in, in by the ACT government. That would be what I'd be arguing for. <laughs> yep. 
And uh, Andrew, mm -hmm. is, does the Liberal Party have a view on the matter? We've uh, advocated consistently, uh, David, for the ACT government to uh, accept the Commonwealth's funding for school chaplains. Um, this, this is a no-brainer. We've got the Commonwealth government offering money to support students, uh, teachers and their families in our school communities to the ACT at no expense to the ACT taxpayer and the Education Minister on ideological grounds is refusing. Um, so we've, we've advocated for and actively supported school chaplains, the work that they do in our schools across you know, all sectors, um, you know, the, the systemic schools, the independent schools and um, most importantly, our public schools. We think that there is a significant role that they can play. Uh, and when you talk to a teacher in a classroom who is struggling with you know, more uh, you know, issues in, in the student cohort than they ever have before, of, of depression, anxiety, um, behavioural issues, they need all the help and the support that they can get. And I think it is really short-sighted of, of the Education Minister and the Labor government to you know, refuse that funding. Um, it's a disservice to, to all of our community. Mm. Very good. Um, uh, Lara, Lara being um, from the diocese, what's, your, what's the diocese view on chaplain key? Uh, well, I don't have it conferred, <laughs> but it's, I, I just totally agree with uh, our yeah. two other speakers. It's just a no-brainer. The, the federal government is providing the funds and it, is, it seems very uh, kind of arrogant, really, on ideological grounds to turn that away and the good thing to remember is it's not just private schools that are religious it, state schools in the act according to the national center for pastoral research the majority of students in our state schools in the act um, identify with a religious yeah. affiliation yeah. and also chaplains are available to people with no religious mm. affiliation Correct. as well so yeah. it's just very difficult to understand mm. what that one's about thank you david Yes, uh, might just ask this of all three, perhaps beginning with Lara, a question from Craig. In my view, social engineering is not for governments. It has never worked in the past. Mm. So why are governments entering into social engineering? Very good question. Um, as a Catholic, one of our fundamental, um, I, think, I guess, guideposts is a principle of subsidiarity. And that just means that the smallest possible unit that can function healthily um, should be left to do so and when it can't function well it should be supported by a larger group so the family is the absolutely most um, fundamental and most robust um, institution um, over the history of humanity and it should be left to function as well as it can on its own and just and only interfered with when needed and it's very uh, incongruous at a time when we can when government policy is saying we shouldn't remove children from their families, we should support the family, even when there's really serious issues going on in the family, it's better to use government funds to support that family and leave the child in the family and give them the skills they need. And yet then we're coming in with this, um, you know, very hand, heavy handed approach, telling parents how they're going to bring up their children in the most intimate um, issues in their life. It's just, um, just seems crazy to me. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So, uh, Andrew, here in South Australia, we've got some good fellows on both sides of politics. Uh, we have a very left-leaning Liberal Attorney General who is driving some social engineering policies. So it's not like we're trying to tar the ALP with, with uh, all, the bad, <laughs> all the bad news. Um, but in principle, why do you think it is that governments of both political persuasions tend towards social engineering? I think that political correctness has, has become a, a big driver. There's a, a noisy minority that, that champions their agenda. Um, and often at the detriment of, you know, often they're referred to as you know, the quiet Australians. Most, most people are too busy trying to make ends meet, keep a job, raise their family and just get on with life that they haven't got the time or the, or the inclination to engage in, in the political debate. But I, I've been in politics for, for about nine years, you know, actively as a, either as a member or as a candidate. And this is the first time out door knocking through the election campaign where I've met more people that say, I normally just had faith that our leaders would do the right thing, but I'm seeing more and more that that's not the case and I need to be more engaged and I pay, need to pay more attention. Um, I think at an ACT level, we certainly saw 
people standing up for their beliefs, standing up for what they thought was reasonable legislation or, or unreasonable legislation in the, in the conversion therapy debate. Um, it was probably the first time in my, my time in the assembly where uh, particularly the faith community said, this is not acceptable. This is not a law that defines the society that I want to live in. And they rung up their local members. Uh, hundreds of them run my office as they did my colleagues and, and also those of Labor and the Greens, putting their voice forward. It saw some change both in the view of some of my colleagues, um, it shifted the debate, but also in, in some of the actions and the amendments that the government brought. Uh, so every, everyone's voice is important and it needs to be counted. I think that you know, governments think that they can get away with this because people are often distracted and not paying attention to those incremental changes. But you know, the, the, the sum of all the uh, incremental changes is greater than, you know, as a whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Mm. And you know, is worrying. Um, you know, a, a really good friend of mine uh, and, and put it very bluntly the other day and said, you know, the government's responsibility stops at the road and at the footpath at the front of my home and they do a pretty poor job of maintaining that. What gives them the right to reach into the family home and tell me how to ra raise my children? And and I think that's a really, you know, fits with Lara's point that, you know, the family is the most important unit in our society. And mm. how I raise my children may not be how my neighbours would choose to raise theirs, but we're entitled to that view and and should be, you know, protected by the laws of our community to, to do so, you know, appropriately. Mm. Thank you. Uh, Brendan, here in South Australia, our Liberal Premier is pro-prostitution and he is pro-euthanasia. Whereas the Labor alternative premier, Peter Malinowskis, is very concerned about prostitution and is thoroughly pro-life. So maybe if you're not successful here in the ACT, you might want to run here in <laughs> South Australia, where, where you will be welcomed among friends, uh, certainly in the ALP. Um, but why the social engineering? It's, uh, it's not just one party, it's both parties that tend towards social engineering. Why is that? David, it's a good question. I mean, I think to one extent, it's probably not just reflective of political parties or any particular political party, but I do think what's at stake is in contemporary Australian society, there is a prevailing false and narrow view of personal autonomy. And this applies whether you're talking about a gender issue, whether you're a gender identity issue, um, whether you're talking about abortion or you're talking about euthanasia people have a sense of autonomy as like my my life is mine it's my choice rather than focusing on the interconnectedness of our lives and um, of course family is that point of personal interconnection but we're all interconnected our lives are you know we share our lives with each other in god's kingdom and i think what politicians need to stand against Andrew and Liberal and Labor uh, is that view that says that personal autonomy is king. And, uh, you know, we now have to stand back and look to the notion of the common good rather than just personal freedom uh, in, in that extreme sense, which um, is pop uh, perpetuating contemporary Australian society. Let me, let me just follow that up, please, Brendan and Andrew, and I'm in particular, Lara, as well, in a minute. Look, please explain why is it that candidates and political parties are reluctant to take ethical and moral issues to the people, to the voters? And in particular, I think, Andrew, you hit on the fact that, that families are very critical, and they are critical. And as I kept mentioning before, that parental rights are being torn away. So are you as candidates going to... Uh, concentrate or make more visible the ethical and moral issues that people, families are really concerned about. So Andrew first and then Brendan and Lara, I'd like to hear your view as well. Hmm. Um, thanks, Greg. Look, I think that it's often an, a, a difficult area for parties to tread. Um, yeah. you know, my views are, are not the same as all of my colleagues, like Brendan's aren't the same as, as, as all those in his party as is clearly articulated tonight. So where I think there's a divergence of opinion, parties tend to steer clear because not only is there that divergence inside of the party, but likewise in the broader community. Um, what I've done personally is when I've you know, been in a position where I haven't agreed with, I guess, the, the stated party position or, um, 
or, or beyond that, even the you know the, the direction that mm. the community is heading in, I've I've taken a stand. Be it you know speaking to to the electorate as I did the other just a matter of weeks ago on um, amendments to the, uh, the Birth, Deaths and Marriages Act. Um, uh, previously in the assembly, I, I've taken a stand to to defend um, religious confessions uh, for, for the Catholic Church, which you know is a as someone who was raised a Catholic, that, that is a, a, an important institution in the church that needs to be protected. Um, I think it's up to individuals to take that stand where, where they, they're engaged. Um, and political parties and, and, and the political machines that, that, that are behind them are, are there to win elections. And they're going to try and find the path of least resistance to, to win as many votes as possible. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and for better or for worse, often you know, the, the social issues that you know, are sometimes a bit curly, don't feature because they 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 pose some resistance. Um, mm. That's where I think it is is really dependent upon every okay. voter to to meet their local candidates, meet their existing members, um, ask what their personal views are, and, and at the other side of that, actually articulate what what you as a, a voter's views are. Um, often we sit in that that parliament and we you know we look at something and go, this is really poor legislation, but when there's no other voices to say we agree with you, uh, it, it's often a very difficult position to be in to say we have an issue with this. When you know, the majority view that is public is uh, you know, is in contrary. Yep. Thank you, Brendan. Quickly. Well, I, quickly, I can simply say that the reason most politicians don't stand up moral issues is because they're ambitious. Yeah. <laughs> and, 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 and and to do such a thing like that is not usually a good <laughs> career move. <laughs> Uh, for myself, I think whatever position I take, my views already know. So uh, yeah. I don't have a. I mean, look at Kevin Rudd, right? He he's a very socially conservative guy, but he kept it all to himself for yeah. many many yeah. years. And yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so unfortunately, okay. political advancement's not necessarily conducive to taking a controversial view. Yeah. Thank you, Larry. I mean, the Catholic Church is the second highest contributor to social welfare in Australia. I think. What are your comments in terms of these ethical moral issues not being aired in the in the public square? Yeah, I mean, I guess there's there's a prevailing cultural view that's becoming stronger and stronger that that religion is a private matter, um, but I think we need to stand against that because I mean, religion affects every area of your life. Um, it affects your your economics. It affects your mm. you know everything about what you do and how you operate in the world. So. Um, I guess that's my only comment is that as mm -hmm. Christians, we should um, just stand our ground, ground and yep. say, no, this, I'm, a, yep. I'm a human being, I'm a voter, I'm a, mm. uh, in a democratic mm. society and I have a, have a right to air my views publicly. And uh, culturally, mm. we need to be moving away from this idea that religion is a private matter. It's not a private matter. It has lots of public implications and we need to keep insisting on the right to speak about our views and our values. Amen. David. Yes, a couple of the webinar participants are looking forward, mm. Brendan, to seeing details about you, your photo and views on the ALP website. So I'm sure you've got that on your list of things to do. But I, a, notice I don't have a photo on the website and I complained to my campaign manager yesterday and his response was, well, no one looks at that anyway, Brendan. Well, <laughs> I can, I can tell, him, can tell him that 10% uh, yeah. of the webinar participants, I think it is, have raised, have raised the issue. To, um, prove, I'll, I'll, I'll tell my team to get the photo up there, but if you want to see a photo, you can just go to the trailer on Cotter Road. You're in Adelaide, so you don't know where that is, David, but it's a big road in Canberra. <laughs> where you'll see a, a big seven foot um, photo of Brendan that's just been spray painted all over it. So, um, uh, all right. So it's not just your photo, though, but details as well as what they're yeah. after. Sure. But, so um, I'll, I'll, let, I'll let you uh, work on that. I'll simply and, say, as a response, and thanks for the opportunity, is I'm an economist and a family man, a committed Catholic who's uh, studied Catholic theology and tries to spend his time, his life, his vocation in trying to bring gospel values, biblical values into public policy. And so and I've done that as a, um, attempted to do that as a political advisor to four cabinet ministers. So I bring right. that experience to that, to the, at the you. federal level. So let's, let's go back to Lara, a question from 
MJ, why is the minority? Why does the minority have a much louder voice than the majority? Mm, <laughs> good question. I mean, I think, I perhaps it's perhaps it's a hangover from the fact that we have enjoyed as a Judeo-Christian, you know, we have in, we have enjoyed Judeo-Christian values in our society for for generations, and so we ha we're not used to having to fight for uh, what we believe in. We're not used to having to actually, to, and I think we're only beginning to wake up to the fact that so many of the values upon which our society has been built are being eroded from underneath us. And uh, so, yeah, I think we're still waking up to the fact that we actually have to rebuild um, a Judeo-Christian culture because it's, yep. uh, it's sort of, uh, we're, we're just sort of left with a bit of a shaky edifice at the moment and not, very strong foundation. Thank you for that reply. And Andrew, where is the voice of the majority? We used to use that, that term moral majority years ago. Yeah, look, I think, as I said before, um, you know, the, you know the, 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 the quiet majority are too busy just, you know, running their lives and, and, and you know, living as, as best they can, that they don't have time to pay attention to the political discord and then get involved. Um, I think a, a large part of the social change is driven um, you know, by our youth, particularly coming out of our universities, um, where you know, you, they're, they're young and carefree at, at, at that, that stage. And you know, once people hit that family time in their life, uh, there, there's so much more going on. But as I said, you know, more and more this election than any other, I, I'm hearing people say, enough is enough, I need to pay attention, I need to get more involved. Um, and that is, you know, people of faith and, and, and even people of, of, of little faith, but, you know, be they in business or you know, other parts of our community, they've said enough is enough and, you know, it's time to take a stand. It's time to have their voice be heard. Um, I think Lara's right. We've, we've been able to trust blindly for, for so very long in Australia, but that's not the case now. We, we, we've seen... You know, a number of times, even just recently, you know, as recent as this year with uh, you know, the Black Lives Matter rallies where uh, there's seemingly a rewriting of our history. Um, you know, not all of our history is flattering, not all of the, the decisions that have been made in the past cast us in good light, but they serve us as a reminder of the mistakes we've made and uh, never to venture there again. Trying to erase them from history, I think, seeks to, to do a disservice to future generations. Mm. Thank you, Andrew. And Brendan, the wheel that squeaks the loudest gets the oil, as they say. Why is it that this minority voice is in the ascendancy and how can we empower the majority? I think one thing we are struggling with is this notion of identity politics. And we've inherited from America. And, and it's this sense that, you know, you're, you're in this box, you're in that box, you're in that box. And well, these boxes, these categories, are seen as being competing, rather than coming together to find a more holistic solution where you, you know, people join together in their connections and in and, and their cultures and in their lives and in their faith experience. So I, I think what we need to do is to seek to avoid identity politics, uh, and that which I, I think is cruel in democracy in the West. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sorry, yeah, yeah, Brendan yeah. And, and Andrew, very quickly, um, you're probably following New South Wales politics in the last couple of days. Um, the New South Wales Liberals can't govern really without the Nationals. Does the ACT government, being Labor at the moment, with the Greens, how much are you beholding to the Greens in terms of policy? And Andrew, for you, would you look at a coalition with, say, independence if need be? Brendan first. Well, if Labor gets 13, we won't have to deal with Shane Rattenbury. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and that is a realistic possibility. So if Brendan Long is successful, we might not have to deal with the Greens. And I must say, I think that the influence that they have on ALP policy is too strong. And let's be clear, this gender identity bill was a bill that came from the Greens. Right? So, I mean, I think that Labor needs to stand up against a radical left agenda that comes from the Greens. Thank you. Andrew, coalition? Um, 
we're, we're, we're playing we're playing to win 13 yeah. sets. Okay. Uh, yeah. right. And, that, and that, that, that's the quickest roadmap to government. But I, I think Brendan's right. All too often, uh, you do see the tail wagging the dog with, with what is a, you know, a very extreme left-wing agenda from the Greens. Um, but that said, there, there are also some in the Labor Party uh, in the Assembly that you know, often seek to outgreen the Greens uh, by trying to be more, more socially progressive. And you know, a number of those, those uh, views have, have come forward in legislation and motions uh, over the over the past term, where you know often that left flank is uh, is trying to you know recapture ground from the minor party. Thank you, right. David. Yes, indeed. Um, and tonight we're really getting some very strong yeah. practical yeah. advice coming Ooh. from the <laughs> webinar participants. Listen to this. Please tell viewers from Sharon that there is a Facebook a public Facebook page, Dr. Brendan Long, Labor for Murrumbidgee, with photo but no about details. So once again, Brendan, you'll have to take that away. And a comment um, about Lara Kirk. She is clearly highly intelligent and extremely articulate. When is she standing for parliament? And this is from <laughs> someone called Tim, who seems to have the same surname as you, Lara. So I'd like to respond to that. <laughs> That's Tim Kirk. <laughs> Why don't you stick to the wine production? <laughs> Lara, do you have political ambitions? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, all right. <laughs> all right. Well, um, I think I've exhausted my yeah. questions now. I'm, Greg, do you have some? Yeah, I've, I've got one more. Um, right. is, it, is it clear to you both that one of the things commonly, New South, um, the ACT Parliament doesn't open in prayer as such? Now, I know the current practice is that there's a uh, sort of a commitment to country and then you have a quiet time. Why don't you just introduce prayer? Andrew, Brendan, Lara? First, um, <laughs> the, uh, the Australian Catholic University produced an interesting little book which summarised all of the prayers that are said at the beginning of all of the parliaments around the country. Yep. And there are beautiful prayers said in all of the parliaments except one. And that's this one. And again, this back to the Greens agenda. I mean, yeah. uh, we have a secularist radical party in this in this um city and well i think one of the things i'd like to take up is that we reintroduce prayer in the assembly amen, amen. <laughs> andrew <laughs> I, i'm surprised to hear brendan say that when uh, it was uh, the party he seeks to represent that actually banned uh members from uh partaking in religious activities uh as, as a parliamentarian uh, we used to have a, uh, a, a church service, a, a non-denominational service at the beginning of each sitting year, hosted by the Speaker, and uh, it was the uh, former Chief Minister and now Senator for the ACT who uh, used her numbers with the Greens in the Assembly to put a ban to that from ever occurring again. Um, likewise, the, the, the prayer got watered down into a reflection. Uh, you know, we're asked to either pray or reflect. Um, I say a prayer every morning when we, when we, when we uh, assemble. I think it should be back. Uh, it's great to see our federal parliament still mm. uh, maintains that institution. Yeah. And uh, it, you know, it'd be good to see that reintroduced in the ACT. We'll wait till Brenda gets in and we can work together. <laughs> Lara, is it a good idea to have opening prayer in parliament to set the tone and the mood of, uh, of debate? Look, I think so. I don't really have any more to say on that. <laughs> <laughs> good. Oh. All right, well, look. <laughs> Gentlemen, look, thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to ask David to close in prayer in a minute, but can I just say that politics is an interesting game. I, I myself worked at, as an advisor to a prime minister, but, but I know what it's like. I know how difficult it can get. Uh, the thing is that it's very hard when you have moral, ethical, social issues that tend to differ from your party. So I, I, do, I do feel for both of you gentlemen, but may I just say to you that, um, Let's pray for godly government, uh, whichever party wins, because I think that's going to be critical for families, for children, and of course, for the entire economy. So David, could you close in prayer? And yes. then I want to thank everybody for coming. Yes, uh, as we conclude in prayer, I'm reminded of those remarks of uh, Senator, the former Senator Brian Harradine, who said, we begin the Senate each day with prayer and it's downhill from there. <laughs> but um, you wonder how much th worse things would be if not for that prayer, which is not just any prayer, 
it's a distinctively Christian prayer because it includes the prayer which our Lord taught us. And so I might even conclude with that, but uh, let's pray now. Our Father, we thank you for this opportunity tonight. We pray for the election that's coming up, as Greg has pointed out, in a sense, regardless of, of who is elected, that we would be quietly and godly governed. And so may your wisdom be upon uh, each of the candidates and uh, we commit the election to you. And I pray for Brendan as he's running for parliament mm. and we thank you that he is a godly voice in a party that needs huge reform. I pray for Andrew and his ongoing work in the assembly, be with him in his future. And uh, we pray for all of the candidates that you will uh, bless and guide each one of them. And so we conclude now with uh, committing the election to you, all of those many policies and issues, all of the candidates. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. 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 Lara, thank you very much. Andrew, thank you very much as well. And Brendan, delighted to have you back. God bless and uh, thank you for our registration uh, people on the webinar. There will be a copy made of this video which we'll send to you. In the meantime, may I wish you good night and God bless.